everyone. Welcome to our third day of the 2021 Global Youth Institute. Hi, I'm Kelsey Tyrrell again. Uh, we are so excited to have you here. I know yesterday was a pretty big day. We had over 260 delegates from 11 countries presenting their ideas, their solutions, and their plans on how to take action around the world. Uh, it was an incredible day, and we're going to build on that momentum this morning or this afternoon or this evening, whatever time zone you're in, um, to talk about how we're going to turn those ideas into action. Um, just a few reminders. I know some of you are um, clicking directly on the Zoom link that's in Whova for chat and engaging with other delegates. We just want to make sure that you put all of your questions and your comments in the Whova chat. Uh, it's hard to keep uh, two different chat streams going within Zoom and within Whova. So uh, if you click directly in the Zoom link, just head back to Whova and we'll have your questions and conversation there. Um, a few other reminders. I know uh, the majority of you have received your conference in a box already, and some were just uh, a little bit stuck in transit. But if you have your conference in a box, we're actually going to be using some of the items today or talking about the importance of some of those items. So if you have that handy, feel free to have it next to you um, because we're going to be doing some fun things or and talking about uh, some really non-traditional foods possibly for some of you, um, which is why we put those in the box for you this year. So depending on what time zone you're in, it might be lunch or dinner time for you. So we thought we'd bring out some of those special items, uh, especially since the theme of this session is all about creating good food for all. And what does good food mean? So actually, I even prepared um, my own, I'm making sure I've got this on camera, my own anchovy pasta. Uh, you can see them right here. Uh, all of you should have gotten anchovies in your conference in a box. And you might be thinking, why anchovies? Well, in many cultures, fish is considered healthy and good brain food. There are multiple nutrients in fish, micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, and essential fatty acids. And these nutrients are very important for cognition, uh, growth and development in children, and also for keeping their mothers well-nourished. Now we've been talking a lot about our 2021 World Food Prize Laureate, Dr. Shakuntala Tilstead. And actually because of her work and her research, millions of families across many countries are actually eating small fish like anchovies, uh, providing key nutrients that will protect children for a lifetime. So the future of good food depends on food like anchovies. Um, and it helps us keep us healthy and uh, help us reach our full potential. It strengthens our communities, powers our economies and protects our planet. But not everybody gets good food every day. And the way that we produce and market food can be sometimes harmful to our environment. And this has to change. At the heart of creating good food, there are some pretty instrumental players like food producers and chefs, which is why we have invited a few of them here today to join us. Now, before I introduce this guest panel, I just wanna play a quick video for you about the important role that chefs play within creating a sustainable food system and what they are doing to take action around the world. So uh, we'll take a look at uh, the chef's pledge. The chefs commit to accelerate food systems transformation to help achieve the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. We pledge to ensure good food for all by taking action on the chefs' manifesto thematic areas. First and foremost, in one or more of the following ways. 
I will get to know my ingredients. How are they grown, reared, or sourced? I will choose ingredients with the lowest impact on the environment. I will lead by example to maintain the rich diversity of the world's natural larder. By using different varieties of plants, grains, and proteins, I will champion wild variants and avoid monoculture. I will get to know my ingredients, who grows, harvests, sources, and packages them. How do they get to you? I will investigate the journey from farm to fork. I will choose ingredients with as few intermediaries as possible between myself and the farmer. I will lead by example through separating, monitoring, and setting targets to reduce food waste. I will use my purchasing power, buying locally produced foods in season and avoiding ill-fated foods. I will lead by example, making vegetables, beans, and pulses the center of my dishes. I will be a community food champion, showcasing best practice in food safety, allergens, and nutrition in our kitchens, through our menus, and educating chefs of the future. I will be a community food champion, supporting initiatives that provide access to nutritious meals. I pledge to do my part. To do my part. To do my part and to ensure good food for all. All right, uh, we just, uh, I really love that video from chefs around the world and some of those chefs you're actually uh, going to be talking with today. So if I could invite my panel of guest speakers to join us on screen, um, I'll introduce them right now. And then that way I can enjoy my anchovy pasta while they're all talking to you about good food. So we will go ahead and cue our panelists here. Um, we actually have uh, our first uh, panelist who's actually going to be moderating this conversation about what good food means. Um, and her name is Tiare Boyce. She is a second generation Canadian fish harvester from Vancouver Island. She has worked for her family's small, small fishing business since she was 12 and continues to work on her family boat. With 19 years of experience working at sea in the British Columbia integrated ground fish industry, she is can, a Canadian delegate serving on the conference board for the International Pacific Halibut Commission and is an industry representative on the Canadian Seafood Value Chain Roundtable. Tiare has represented her family's small fishing company at the Committee on World Food Security at the FAO in Rome since 2016 on the private sector mechanism. And currently, Tiare is serving as an ocean ambassador with the Marine Stewardship Council, working with the organization to support sustainable seafood harvesting practices and to end overfishing. So, Tiare, welcome. Next, we have Chef Mega Kohli. Chef Mega is one of India's youngest head chefs. Deeply influenced by her grandmother's and mother's cooking, she started puttering around in the kitchen when she was barely five, indulged, and as uh, she was by her grandmother, who had no qualms about her messing up the kitchen. Chef Mega has already garnered experience of 13 years in the industry at such a young age. She was awarded the Times Chef of the Year Award in 2020 by the acclaimed and respected food critic, Ms. Maram Rashi at the Times Food Awards in March, 2020. Welcome Chef Mega. And next we have Sharon Surrey. Sharon specializes in interdisciplinary research and development in nutrition sensitive fish agri-food systems. She's currently a PhD candidate studying fish trade networks in Indonesia within the innovative knowledge about networks, fish for food project through the University of Amsterdam. Prior to this, she served as a Peace Corps volunteer in rural Senegal, after which she completed her master's in globalization and development at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex and spent over six years working with World Fish, which is where our 2021 World Food Prize laureate work set as well. So we're excited to have her here with us. Our next guest is Chantal Nicholson. She's a multi award winning chef, former chef patron of now close and much loved 
Covent Garden restaurant Treadwells, which was also recipient, recipient of a green Michelin star in 2021. She is also the owner of All's Well, a pandemic pop-up restaurant. As one of the leading female voices in the UK's hospitality industry, Chantel is an advocate for seasonality and sustainability, championing veg forward cooking through both her restaurants and her cookbook, Planted. Originally from New Zealand and a trained lawyer, actually, Chantel is committed to creating a more sustainable future across her operation and activities, while also being an independent board member for ReLondon, moving London towards a more circular economy. That's a lot of experience in one session. Uh, we're so excited to have you all. So I'm gonna kick it over to Tiare to moderate this conversation. Um, but Tiare, um, I am curious uh, before we get started, what got you into this? I know you've been growing up around uh, fishing, especially with your, your family. Um, it's a family tradition really. Um, why is talking about a sustainability within our food system so important to you? Hi, Kelsey, and hello to our audience and the rest of the panelists. Um, well, fish for food security is very important to me. Um, I'm one of the 2.6 billion people around the world that depend upon fish and seafood as our, my primary source of protein. Um, and I'm one of the 200 million people who depend upon it for our livelihoods around the world. And I really think that um, you cannot be a fish harvester if you're not an environmentalist or a conservationist. And I think it's important to recognize if you're a conservationist or environmentalist um, that one, a very low impact uh, protein can be seafood um, depending on how it is harvested or grown. So those things go hand in hand for me. I can't be a fish harvester without being concerned about food security or the health of our blue planet. Great, thank you so much, Tiare. Um, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time, especially when a lot of your job actually takes you out to sea. So, um, but it's important to have these conversations with the experts. And one other expert we wanted um, to showcase and, and have join us today um, is Paul Newnham with Chef's Manifesto. And this platform that he has built um, is a space where chefs can come together to talk about sustainability within our food system. And so we're gonna hear from Paul um, actually right now about what Chef's Manifesto is and um, why he started uh, this huge platform online. So uh, if you could cue remarks from Paul. My name is Paul Newnham. I'm the director of the Sustainable Development Goal 2 Advocacy Hub and the Chef's Manifesto. Um, I wanted to uh, talk to you today a little bit about why chefs are a part of the solutions to our food system and can help us drive good food for all. Chefs are connectors. They connect what we grow in the field, what we get from the ocean, what we find in rivers, and they connect to people. They put food into different dishes, into different ingredients, and that engages with people. People engage and connect with these different biodiverse ingredients um, on a plate, in a bowl, and this is really critical. Um, it's really critical because that's how we engage with food. And as we engage with food, um, we then start to value it, we start to learn about it, we start to find out more. And I think, you know, this is absolutely critical for us to then understand how we need to work together to really protect uh, those that are working in the food space. Um, so I'm talking about fishers, I'm talking about farmers, I'm talking about gatherers, all these kinds of people that work in, in food systems to create food that we then are able to access. Um, and then I think it's also really important for us um, as we think about human health um, and how we think about the different ingredients and understand how they come together into giving us the nutrients we need. And so um, the Chefs Manifesto is a network of chefs around the world. We have chefs in over 90 countries um, and they connect around a framework of eight thematic areas which are built around the, the, the sustainable development goals. And so these eight thematic areas were uh, voted on, 
created and, and, and agreed by chefs for chefs. And so this network provides practical actions around each of those eight areas. It helps chefs to be able to connect the work that they're doing around sustainability um, into a global frame of the sustainable development goals. And this is really important for them, them to then learn from one another and to be able to share their experiences. Um, this connects to a bigger idea of Good Food For All, which is to really think about the question of what good food means. Um, when we talk about food, we, 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 we often talk about taste. Does it taste good? Do I like it? But it's also questions around, is this good for the people that made it? Is this good for my body? Is, is this giving you know, good for the environment and the climate? And this is really critical if we're gonna drive forward the change that we need. And chefs can play a key role in helping to really drive and advocate for that. Chefs, when they talk about an ingredient, when they talk about some sort of dish, um, people listen because uh, chefs can bring in cultural elements, traditions, and this is really important. And so um, this year's World Food Prize winner um, Shakuntala Tilstead has worked really hard on really raising the awareness around aquatic foods and the role that they play in uh, nutritious diets. And this is really interesting. And as we've talked with Shakuntala, she sees that really helping people to understand the diversity in the ocean, helping people to understand the diversity in our rivers, in our lakes, is really key. Because people often just think about, you know, fish or seafoods, um, but there's so many other foods out there. There's so much diversity there. There's so many different nutritional um, elements. And so it's really key to actually investigate. And chefs are really great at doing that. They like to play with ingredients. They can be inquisitive and they can help bring that together. And so in order for us to improve nutrition, in order for us to look at climate issues, in order for us to look at biodiversity protection, um, the partnership with chefs is something that's really critical. So as chefs, as young chefs, um, you can be involved. You can connect to the Chef's Manifesto, look at the network, use those action areas to really be a part of helping to drive forward change and solutions. Um, and then connect it to this bigger movement of good towards good food for all. And I think together we can really drive change for both people, planet and prosperity. So as the discussion happens today, I really am keen to understand um, more about how chefs can use their voice, their platform to drive that forward. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much, Paul, for your remarks. Um, as somebody who works at Sea to Harvest Fish, I'm so excited today to have a chat with some of the chefs that um, might prepare some of the fish that I've caught. Um, and I think Paul made some really, really excellent points. First of all, food is at the center of all that we do, um, no matter if we are harvesters or if we are chefs. So I would like to go to each of you to ask you, what does good food mean to you? And I'd like to start with Chef Chantal Nicholson, please. Chef, what does good food mean to you? Thanks, Yari. I think, as Paul alluded to, there's many facets that come with food and I think from that perspective it, it's ensuring that everybody has food so food security I think it's also about the biodiversity in terms of that we're not just eating the kind of five crops that the, the world you know the, the majority of our calories come from and I think it's also you know food something to be enjoyed it's something that we can that can bring us pleasure it can bring people together so I think it's it's kind of a it's a combination of, of many different things to many different people. And I think it, it connects us all globally. It connects us all locally. I think it's really important to, to kind of focus on that, that locality um, and the biodiversity, especially at, the, at this time. Excellent point, Chef. Yeah, I think diversity is resiliency, but it's also deliciousness. <laughs> That's what makes our, our, our recipes and things so delicious is having a diversity of ingredients. Uh, Chef Mega Kohli, can I go to you next? What does good food mean? Uh, so good food to me means, uh, I think good food is something that has really been misunderstood over the years. And it's, um, as uh, Chef Shondell said, it encompasses a, a very, very vast um, array of things that qualify to make something good food. And it's not just delicious food or tasty food as 
you know when people now say oh, that was a really good meal or it's really good food that place has really good food uh, they refer only to taste but i think that it has to support the local economy uh, the um, good food and it has to uh, support local communities indigenous communities uh, indigenous ingredients biodiverse ingredients um and i think diversity of course is extremely important because i think 60 to 70% of our diets come from just potatoes um maize uh and rice whereas there is so much more that uh, mother earth has given us to that is that that you know that we should cook with and um lastly uh, good food is something that uh, nourishes not only our bodies but also the health of our planet and the environment so yeah that's what good food means to me excellent point and and i really agree with your point that um good food is is deeper than just flavor so thank you so much chef uh next i'd like to go to sharon sharon what does good food thank you um yeah i mean to to agree i can't help but agree with chantal and with mega um and i really think about sort of the pillars that we talk about of food security so also is the food affordable is it accessible can you get it is it safe when you get it um you know and, and in terms of food being nourishing and nutrition nutritious um looking at diverse foods are you always eating the same food things like that um as was mentioned how is it produced in these systems for example one of the reasons why we talk a lot about small fish is because they generally um uh, reproduce more quickly so they don't have take so long to get more of them um and then also of course is cultural preferences so what do you want to eat what tastes good to you so i think those are some of the the factors for me that define good food excellent points i think we can all agree that good food is complex and uh i think for me good food also means that the harvesters are being treated well and uh that's that's just one more layer to all this complexity So I think next I would like to ask uh Chef Chantel. Um I know that you trained as a lawyer in New Zealand and that is where you're from, but today you are a renowned chef living in London. What was your path? How did you get here? It's been quite a winding path. <laughs> um I must say, but I think for me, you know, grow I'm very privileged to grow up have grown up in New Zealand where food and food production is you know it, it's prevalent i was um you know food was something that was quite important in in my family um food production as well i had um an aunt and uncle who had a stone fruit orchard so i kind of saw firsthand you know the the challenges with with growing and producing food as well as just you know the deliciousness of of freshly picked sun ripened fruit which kind of doesn't compare to food that's been flown halfway around the world. So, I think for me that was always kind of a passion. Um yeah, I went into a path of of kind of going to university when I finished um school, but that passion for food just kind of remained. I kind of couldn't couldn't get rid of it. Um and I actually was fortunate enough to be offered a job in London um as a chef after having entered um a competition, actually a cooking competition. Um which was held in New Zealand. So I I kind of jumped on a plane 17 years ago and and thought I'd come to London for 2 years. Um and that was 17 years ago and I think I guess what has morphed in that time and I guess as I've kind of got a bit more experience and and got older um is that real kind of you know it's just saying what is good food what does food mean it's so much more than just putting something on a plate it's you know it's where it came from it's how it got there it's who who grew it who picked it who who caught it who who you know nurtured it to become what it what it became um and i think to be able to kind of celebrate that and really hone in on that is what what is important to me now and to be able to yeah celebrate local food celebrate biodiversity um and also look at the the bigger picture of you know how the food got to the plate and and what is the best what's the best way possible of doing it um and and in my job you know as a chef is how can i make that very precious thing taste as you know as amazing as i can how can i teach others about it how can i educate others and how can i inspire others to be able to you know really do the same and kind of respect that food and and be educated by it and learn from it 
and nourish it as well as nourishing ourselves as well as the planet and the you know kind of mother nature yeah i think you hit the nail right on the head there food is precious and i think how we treat it how we harvest it how we raise it should reflect that i think that's yeah a very good point what a path you have had and i hope your path continues to wind in the best ways possible <laughs> um, thank you next i'd like to oh, sorry Next, I'd like to ask Sharon. Um, uh, I know you've worked closely with the 2021 WFPF laureate, Dr. Shankantala Tilstead, on increasing access to nutrient dense small fish species like anchovies and sardines and herring. Um, although we know that this fish is good for us, we might not be used to eating these, these species on a daily basis. So, do you have any tips for us? Um, how do you convince us and our audience to eat more of these, these little fish? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I guess I should start by saying, even myself as a kid growing up in California, I thought small fish like anchovies and sardines were those weird gross things. Like people order them on pizza, like, Ugh, but you always ask not with the anchovies or they're so gross. And, and I probably got those ideas from watching way too much television. Um, but that kind of brings in a sense about marketing and how important it is, these narratives that we have around, around fish and different foods. So, so when you think about certain um, foods, in particular fish, you know, what's the first reaction that comes to mind? Um, you know, and in fact, a lot of the work that um, Shakuntala has done at World Fish, which I've been fortunate to work with her on, is around social behavior change communication. So what, how do you get people to change their behavior? How do you convince someone who thinks, you know, oh, that's gross or, or I don't want it or I've heard that's bad. You're not supposed to eat that if you're pregnant or something like that. Um, how do you address these, these opinions, these, these myths sometimes, these narratives? Um, and so, you know, for me, one thing that I hadn't realized for a long time is, you know, fish doesn't always look like fish. So you can have you know, moving to, to Southeast Asia and living there for some time, um, you come across fish in a lot of things I never even thought about, like fish sauce and oyster sauce and fish paste, shrimp paste, all of these different things that are used as seasonings. Um, and so incorporating fish and diverse foods into your diet can look, um, it doesn't always look the same. It's not always the same as putting a big fish on your plate. Um, and so I think uh, being aware of that also um, in terms of bringing more into our diet, it's not about eating, you know, everyone eating all fish all day, every day at all. It's about having these diverse diets. Um, and, and so starting to, to look at how you can incorporate some of these, you know, if you think about what you're eating, you know, you're having chicken for dinner, you're having beef for dinner, something like that. You know, when can you change up what you're having? Can you replace something in the in your current um, meal that you're preparing? Can you replace that with a different ingredient, like a kind of fish or an ingredient there? Um, I also encourage like eat, try out different cuisines. You know, you can get a lot of ideas, I think, from trying different kinds of food at different, you know, different restaurants, or if you have friends who are from different places. I think these are all great ways to get exposed to different flavors and styles of cooking to start to become more familiar and used to that and to, to kind of start you can develop a taste for a lot of these things so yeah excellent point Sharon I couldn't agree more and I really like your point about how fish don't actually need to look like fish for you to eat them and and that also ties in with food waste and you know eating every bit of the fish and, and making things out of it um, I know that my curries suffered for a long time uh, because I never added fish sauce and it was the missing ingredient. I'm still not great at making a curry, but <laughs> um, so next I'd like to go to Chef Megha. Um, I would like to ask you, so I'm also, I'm a young female fish harvester. I work in an industry that's very male dominated um, and coming from that background, I'd like to ask you to hear about your experiences working as a young female chef in India. Um, you may have encountered some challenges on your path and do you think you could share with the young people here today uh, some of the key things that you've learned on, on your journey? 
uh, so yeah, being a young chef in India, I a young female chef in India, I did encounter a lot of uh, challenges uh, because it was a male-dominated industry, and also because um, in my country, uh, in this profession, eighty um, percent of the workforce is uneducated. They come from um, small villages and um, rural areas to secure a better life for themselves and their families. However, at the same time, most of them are of uh, come from families and social conditioning where women are not supposed to work and where uh, men make all the decisions and it's a very patriarchal kind of a setup. So the lack of education, the lack of awareness and um, then having a female boss telling you what to do uh, was extremely, extremely challenging because I wasn't teaching them something theoretical. I had to change their basic conditioning. So I would hear comments like, we don't, like, don't your parents care about you? Uh, how, why aren't you married till now? And if, if you were born in our house, you would be married by now and you should have two kids by this age. And we're not supposed to take orders from you. And we don't listen uh, to our wives or our daughters. You're supposed to keep quiet. And um, so, yeah, so, so that was a huge, huge challenge. Uh, apart from that, the fact that even the educated people who came from like uh, uh, urban areas and everything, since it was an extremely male-dominated industry, made the egos were really big because I started in 2007 is when I entered the industry. And at that time, there weren't so many women. So I really had to um, keep hearing a lot of snide comments. And I think my biggest learning was that uh, give it back. <laughs> so uh, don't, don't take things um, lying down, especially when it comes to your gender. That's not something that you should um, be taking snide comments on. So this, is, this, this was the challenge of being a woman in the kitchen. Apart from that, as a chef with guests, I think a lot of challenges that I faced were uh, that why should... Uh, why are you not using imported produce? And why should I pay so much for a local uh, meat or some local fish? Why aren't you importing your uh, fish from Europe or from New Zealand or wherever? And I, I literally had people walking out of my kitchen in of my restaurant in 2012, 2013. Um, and um, because I think I was one of the few people that was celebrating local produce. But uh, people thought that if it's local, it won't be as good. Uh, so, so yeah, that was, that was a, a huge um, challenge. And um, I think also um, educating people about ingredients was a big challenge. Like if I was serving lentils um, on my menu, uh, people would wonder that why should they come to a restaurant order lentils, which their uh, mom or which they've been, you know, growing up eating. We have dal in, in India, which, is, which are lentils that are a daily staple in our house. But then, you know, to make the same lentils, creative to to and to convince people to order and to eat eat um, those uh, local indigenous ingredients that were good for them and good for the planet's health was also a challenge because I couldn't trust the server to go and take the order uh, because I felt that as a chef the kind of um, passion and the kind of um, uh, how I could explain my dish to a guest uh, a server or a restaurant manager would not be able to to do the same so the learning was also that whenever I launch a new menu, I make sure that for the first few weeks, at least, I am going to every single table explaining my philosophy, not just putting it down on the menu in written, but doing that too, but also trying to have a conversation. Because if we want to spread awareness of good food, uh, it starts by uh, through a conversation. It doesn't just start by just putting a menu and expecting them to understand it themselves. I think as chefs, we really have to spread the word on our social media and talking to people, um, telling people our suppliers. I think chefs need to share who their suppliers are so that people can also buy the same produce in their own house. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, these are a few of my learnings. That's incredible, Chef. I thank you for sharing that. Um, some of the challenges you face, I you haven't backed down from anything. And I find that truly, truly, truly inspiring. Um, I think your, your fight for local food to have it respected and your fight to prove that gender does not equal how hard you can work. And uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate that um, in you. 
and um, I think the conversation that you have with your your um, your patrons is just incredible. It really ties into what Sharon was saying about breaking down misconceptions about food and um, just having that that conversation to uh, break down some of the the mis information or misunderstandings that there are out there as a fish harvester I also have that a lot of people don't look at me and, and think you know this is what a fisherman looks like um so yeah thank you so much for sharing that mega that was that was truly truly inspiring um so I think it's safe to say that uh, most of our audience members um could be convinced to change up some of their eating habits after this panel um, and not only for their health, but also also for the, the well-being of our planet. But of course, it can be a daunting process if we're not used to cooking for ourselves. So if I could go through quickly just each one of you, what are some of the tips and tricks you could offer our audience members and myself um, as for somebody who is either new to cooking or just wanting to start out on, their, on this uh, good food journey? Um, I think first I'll go back to Chef Chantel. I think what's important to remember and what, what I like to remember is that because sometimes it can seem quite daunting and it's kind of like there's a lot to do and a lot to learn. But I think anything, any little tiny thing you do is a step forward and it's learning and it's education and it's, you know, whether it's just seeing what, what if you don't know what foods are in season, where you come from at that particular time. Sometimes that's really useful if you've not grown up around that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky I have a farmer's market close by. So, you know, producers come every Sunday and everything's kind of laid out. So it's quite a visual aid and a visual tool. Um, and obviously it's local. So I think if you can seek out that, that's great. It, obviously not everyone has access to that. So again, perhaps seeing, yeah, what, what is grown or produced or, you know, harvested in your country um, and, and how can you then support that and how can you learn more about it and actually start to think a bit differently about it. I think, you know, we're very lucky now, there's huge, you know, amazing resources everywhere on the internet. And I think, you know, just, just Googling local seasonal food from where you are is a, is a kind of a good starting point if you're not aware. Um, you know, seeing what's biodiversity, a lot of beans and legumes are wonderful for biodiversity. They're great for nitrogen fixing. So just learning about how to do that, I think, one thing, one good resource that I find quite useful, which Meg and I are both familiar with, is the Future 50 Foods, which uh, is a good resource just to have a um, something to, you know, kind of a one-stop shop of to ingredient or produce and ingredients that we need to be eating more of in order to create more biodiversity for the planet, but also for our gut health as well. So it's kind of that dual purpose of, of benefiting ourselves as well as the bigger picture so that's that's one i could recommend which is done by WWF, wwf and nor and so it's quite um easily available online excellent i know i'm going to be looking that up future 50 foods thank you so much chef um next i'd like to go to chef mega um what is what are some of the tips and tricks for people cooking at home i think they just uh, just try to start small and try to substitute uh, in addition to whatever Chef Chantel said that uh, biodiversity and Future 50 Foods is a great, great uh, booklet that you can start with. You can just download it from the internet. I What I made my parents do in the pandemic of my mom when she was planning meals, I told her that substitute one ingredient in your recipe. So if she was making like a, a biryani, which is like a pilaf in, in, that we make at home, I asked her to substitute the rice that she was using with something else. So once we tried to make a millet biryani and we substituted the rice, then the next time we tried to uh, make a black rice biryani, which came, uh, the rice came from this uh, area in Manipur in the north northeastern part of my country. And um, so I think substitution is, is, uh, is a great way where you can enjoy your recipe, enjoy similar flavors, but again, get a, a kick out of a new ingredient that you've, um, that you've introduced into an old recipe. And uh, I'm, uh, trust me that once you substitute something with something that's local and more indigenous, your recipe turns out to be more exotic and it's just as easy to make and more delicious. So I think substitution is a, is a, is a tip that you can follow. That's such a great point. And, and yeah, you can really change up the flavors of what you're cooking just through simple 
substitutions. And I also like the point that both of our chefs have made to start small. And so I'd like to go to Sharon next because she is the expert on small fish. Um, Sharon, how, do you have any tips or tricks on how we can start our good food journey? I think just echoing what, what everyone has said, I mean, starting small, it can be so daunting to try and, you know, if you don't, especially if you don't necessarily grow up in a, in a household where there's a lot of emphasis and on the, you know, or value placed on, on preparing food, if there's not a lot of time put into that, because the, that's the reality for so many people. I mean, convenience foods and, and exist for a reason. So, um, so work with that, set yourself reasonable expectations. And I think that that idea of swapping, in fact, I think there's a link to uh, a book with Chef Chantal um, on swapping different foods out of recipes. Um, you know, experiment a little bit. Um, I think these are, you know, be kind to yourself, starting simple, experimenting, um, and, and just looking at where does your food come from? So if you take a look at what you currently have in your kitchen, and say, okay, well, well, you know, especially the animal sourced foods, but really all of them, you say, where does this come from? So, you know, what's the production system? Look into that um, and just sort of get more familiar with that. I think that that'll take you a long way. Yeah, those are excellent points. I, I absolutely agree with you. Well, um, we've got a, a few questions now from our audience. And um, I think I'd like to go back to, uh, let's see here, Chef Mega. Um, we have a question here that says, how do we encourage inland communities around the world to introduce fish into their diets when fish hasn't been widely available? Is, is there some sort of um, substitution here that, that we can really uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear the question properly, sorry. Sorry, um, how do we in, you know what, I'm going to ask a different question to you because I think this one's a little bit more applicable. Um, and then we'll go back to that question because that's a very good question. Um, people may be more willing to switch to fish if they find something with a similar taste um, to their familiar non fish meats. What are some, uh, it says dupes here or perhaps substitutions for people's favorite dishes. Do you have any suggestions on, on species that are good to try? Good substitutes for fish. Uh, I think uh, I think that you can start with the mock meat <laughs> that that you know that tastes extremely extremely similar. Uh, I remember we were at the Eat Forum in Stockholm, and uh, I tried these fish fingers, and I was uh, I was convinced that that's fish, but it wasn't uh, fish, and it was actually mock meat. And there are a lot of people who are doing uh, really delicious kind of mock meats that you can then kind of start with and then get accustomed to the flavor and then slowly switch to to actual uh, fish. And I think you can, um, I made my brother start eating fish by introducing uh, fish sauce in his diet because the smell would kind of get to him. But then slowly I started making fried rice. So I started making his eggs drizzle with a little bit of, of, of fish sauce and then he slowly got used to the flavor. So these are a few things that I can think of. That's an excellent point. And, and I think uh, at least where I come from here in Canada, sometimes fish can be quite overcooked by people who, who haven't cooked it before. And that gives it quite an intensely fishy flavor. And um, so I think my recommendation for this is don't overcook your fish. Um, I think, yeah, it can be quite a mild flavor depending on the species. And that can be quite delicious and, and a good way to start eating fish if it's not too fishy. <laughs> So um, let's see here, uh, Sharon, I'd like to go to you. We have a, a question. Um, how do we encourage inland communities around the world to introduce fish into their diets when fish has not been widely available? Yeah, um, I think so. Okay, when it comes to food availability, uh, we, we talk a lot about eating locally, which I think is really great, but that's not that doesn't always provide that device diverse diets for everybody. Um, and so it is really important to, to recognize the role that, that supply chains and food value chains play in some of these things. Um, and, and one of the areas of research that Shkundla has worked on among others um, is around 
types of fish that don't necessarily have to be sold as fresh whole fish. So different kinds of processing methods, whether that's smoked. Um, in the US, I think we can often find a lot of tinned uh, or canned fish. Um, again, when fish comes in other forms like fish sauce or fish paste, these things uh, generally allow for much more uh, um, shelf stability, which means you, you can keep them around for long. You don't have to worry so much about them coming fresh from the sea. Um, and so, so I think, you know, go to your local store and have a look around, see what they have. And I would, with all of these things uh, and trying to make food accessible or available in different places, ask your local store, ask them who, if you don't see any fish there, whether it's fresh or frozen or canned or whatever, go and ask them, be like, how do you pick the food that you sell here? You know, and is there a reason you don't have that? One of the challenges with fish is I think, it, and I hadn't realized this until I started working on it more, but it kind of gets forgotten about. We think about food systems and we tend towards these big crops, you know, oh, we think about rice, we think about corn, you know, we think about beef or chicken, maybe pork, and, but fish has just been left off the plate for a long time. And, I, you know, so one of the great things about Shakuntala's award this year is that it's really raising the profile of that. Um, so I would, I would start by asking what's available uh, and explore the stores in your areas. Think of it as a field trip, kind of like, um, they call it like a treasure hunt of some kind to see what you can find. I love that. Yeah, those are those are really good points. Um, I also find that seafood is left off the table when we're discussing food security and it is such an important protein for so many people around the world. And it's such a diverse pool of food. You know, we, we have land-based aquaculture, we have wild capture fisheries in the ocean and, and there's just so much out there. We cannot paint it with a single brush. Um, we, we really need to, to dive into the complexities of fish and, and seafood. Um, next, I'd love to go to uh, Chef Chantel. Um, Chef, how do restaurants, which use much larger volumes of food than an individual, um, how do they deal with reducing food waste and how might supermarkets deal with it? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, I think um, from my perspective, I think any restaurant that obviously if you have got a high volume of, of food going through the restaurant, so you've got, you're serving a lot of people, um, in a way that's sometimes easier to minimise your losses because you've got a high turnover of, of stock. So things aren't kind of sitting around, there's no spoilage. Um, there's also an ability to use things that you wouldn't normally. Um, an example, we used to sell a lot of chips um, at Trade Rails, we do a triple cooked chip and we would go through, you know, kind of many sacks of potatoes a week. Um, and obviously we'd wash them and peel them. And so those peelings, we actually turned into a, a little snack and just kind of you know crispy potato skins so i think there's and you know by using also what so you know using preservation methods so you know dehydrating is great pickling fermenting is really great to be able to prolong things even a freezer is, is incredibly useful um another example we used to sell quite a few scallops um in the uk not many people actually eat the coral or the roe for the scallop so we would freeze those until we had enough and then we would actually create kind of a um like a smoked cod's row dip but using scallop row instead um so just kind of being able to build up a bulk of something to then use it as a dish is kind of you're minimizing waste but you're also increasing um your profit margins as well because you're kind of creating more out of one thing in some way so it's kind of a win-win and plus it just it makes you think of it more as well in terms of how to how to use it. Um, supermarkets, that, that's a really, a really good point. Um, I'm seeing a lot of chat around kind of the globe about certain you know, countries banning waste and things like that, which I think is a, a good step forward. I think um, we saw particularly in the UK in COVID that, you know, the, the, the kind of um, the food system has a very short um, I guess not a shelf life, but things happen so quickly um, in the UK that it became quite apparent that, you know, there kind of wasn't a lot of stock being held. It was more of a, a, a daily thing, which obviously has now been disrupted by the everything else that's going on in the world. Um, 
what happens over here in terms of, of supermarkets is they do quite often anything that is um, out of date or I guess surplus is is you know there's a lot of charities that can take that to then turn it into meals for people um, which is a really great way of doing it there's also a couple of two really great apps in the UK one called too good to go and one called Olio which I think are also global in some other countries um, and it allows you know um, food service or you know cafes restaurants shops to you know at the end of the day if you've got things left over you can kind of sell them off at, at a much cheaper rate so it means that people you know can also get great kind of bargains I guess on food that otherwise potentially would have gone in the bin so there's some kind of really great ideas out there I think it's just having the mindset of trying to minimize it in the first place um, that we we kind of need to, to grasp a, a bit more as well Absolutely. And I think those apps just came out here in Canada. I just heard about it last night, actually. And it's so exciting because I know when I was a student and I didn't have any spare money, I, I would go to the discount bin and get all of the bruised and, and unloved fruit. And so it just it's wonderful to hear how it's spreading around the world. Um, and I also really like your point about developing new dishes. Um, we have done that here with, I, I'm a halibut fisherman and the fillets are a very valuable part of the fish, but um, there's still meat around the collar. And so now chefs are starting to, to um, cook the collar and serve it as an own, its own dish. And, and I just think that's so exciting. So thank you for the work you do as a chef. And thanks for answering that question very comprehensively. It's very exciting to hear about your, your row, your scallop row dishes. And I, I hope one day I can come try it. <laughs> Um, I think next, we've got so many good questions here. I'm so excited. I think here's a, here's a very good one I'd like to pose to you, Sharon. Um, is fish more sustainable than alternative animal protein? Well, I don't have a super concise answer. Um, generally, I wanna say yes, but the challenge with fish, and this is part of the reason I think why fish gets left out of these discussions, so, and again, some of my bias here will show. When you think about adding chicken into your diet or into a meal, you, you go to the store and you get chicken. Maybe it's cut a little bit differently, but it, and maybe it's free range or organic, but it's chicken is kind of that chicken. And if you wanna go get fish, you've got a massive amount of diversity, which tastes different, has different nutrient profiles, comes from different production systems. Um, so one of the challenges, I think, and again, in the marketing of fish and, and incorporating it into school feeding programs or, or things like that is really, when we say fish, that's not a very clear thing. What are, you know, which fish do you mean? Um, some fish really, you know, aren't eaten whole, other fish are. Um, and so, uh, so generally, I would say, I think that they do tend to be a more um, sustainable animal source protein. The other thing that I think doesn't gets left off of the sort of the list of pros about them is they're actually really rich in a lot of nutrients, micronutrients and other things like calcium and zinc and iron and other stuff, which, you know, listen to Shikuntala talk, she'll tell you all about the details. That's really, I mean, that's what she knows um, and where she's really pioneered a, a lot of research. And so, um, so they're not just this pro source of protein, but they're also, you know, much more than that. Um, and I think um, generally, especially when we talk about small fish, they do tend to be um, the production systems that can be produced much more sustainably. As with the caveat, I would say is that as with anything, you can do it well or you can do it poorly. So for example, a lot of fish comes from aquaculture, um, which for those who aren't already familiar, um, you think about like wild caught fish or caught fish where someone goes out and they catch a fish with a net or a pole or something. And aquaculture is where you're farming fish. So you have a pond or some, a lake or something or a tank of some kind. And you start with small fish and you have to feed them and raise them and things like that. And sometimes aquaculture gets a really bad rap. And indeed, you can have poor systems, but you can have poor production systems with chicken and with beef and with pork and all of these other things. So I think... Um, so I'm hesitant to make any blanket statement is why I mentioned that. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, I do think it's a more, uh, more sustainable, environmentally friendly option than a lot of other animal sourced foods. 
I just want to say thank you, Sharon, for not simplifying your answer because I fully agree this is incredibly complex and I don't think, as you say, we can make a blanket statement. Um, I, I know that some of the lowest impact and by impact, I mean impact measured as water use, um, energy use, pollution and greenhouse gas emission can come from species that feed naturally in the ocean and that are harvested with low fuel requirements. Also, five of aquaculture, like there's so many great stories out there that can be very low impact, but there's also some fisheries around our world that we can do much better on and we should never simplify it. This is good, this is bad. We should look at it and embrace the complexities <laughs> and, and try and do better everywhere around the world throughout all of our food systems. So thank you for not simplifying it. <laughs> um, next, I'd like to go to uh, Chef Mega. Um, let's see here. Oh, there's so many good questions. Um, here's, uh, here's one here. Um, what are some vegan friendly options that have similar benefits for those who don't eat animal products? Well, there is soy. There is soy that is a great option. Um, and I, I, I don't understand the fact that when someone is vegan and they want to have something that tastes like meat. So I think that just go for more diverse plant-based uh, ingredients. Like there's lentil, there's hemp, there's so many varieties of vegetables and uh, plants. I think just diversify your plant uh, diet and um, don't really look for something that's a, a meat substitute. But if you if you really do want, uh, there is jackfruit that if if cooked if cooked very well, it gives a very meaty texture. There are mushrooms that have a very uh, meaty, um, the varieties of mushrooms that give um, a meaty flavor to uh, to dishes, and um, yeah, then of course there are mock meats, and then there's soy, so that you that you can then get uh, and and flavor it similarly how you would flavor meat. But the plant world is beautiful, so just explore that is what I would say. I love that. Yeah, em embrace plants for for their own uh, their own power and yeah I think I think that's a great great comment I love lentils and mushrooms and and they're delicious in their own right they don't need to be anything else <laughs> um let's see here um Sharon can we go back to you uh I've got a question here it says how can we improve access to food diversity for people who can't afford nourishing and nutrient rich foods that is a great question. And indeed, um, you know, access is something I study myself. Uh, my PhD research looks at fish trade networks in Indonesia. So how are the people there locally eating outside of big cities and more rural areas um, where there is limited buying power? And, um, and I, you know, it's, you can think about things on different scales. So at the individual level, what can someone do at the community level? What can someone do at the more like in a regional policy level or state policy or federal policy. Um, I think there's, so there's all these different levels on which you can approach it. And I think um, one thing, a lot of that has to be dealt with at a big, at a higher level. Um, and one, you know, whether, I'm not saying that subsidies are the answer, but those are some of the policy tools that are used to make things more or less accessible. They can be used both ways. Um, and, uh, and I, if you think about the, the volumes of food that, that go through, I, I am, I don't work at supermarkets, maybe Chantal, who might be more familiar with this or mega, but, um, you know, if more people are asking for a particular product, um, or a kind of product, I think that that tends to you increase the volume coming through in the traffic, um, which can potentially help to reduce prices. Um, but I would say also don't, it's not incorporating something like fish into your diet. Again, doesn't mean you're only eating like a salmon filet. So if you think about the kind of fish you often see at the store, you've got a salmon filet or some tuna or, or maybe some tilapia, you get a lot of frozen tilapia filets. Um, but those aren't the only ways to bring these into your diet. And in fact, some of the most, um, nutritious parts are the, these offcuts. So as you were mentioning, Tiara, about the, 
the other parts of the halibut. And as Chantal was mentioning about the potatoes and repurposing the potato skins, things like fish stock. Um, I know that uh, a bunch of the researchers at World's Fish come from South Asia and did their studies at a particular university in Scotland. And, uh, and in wanting to cook the foods they were familiar with, they often used a lot of the offcut. So they would go to the grocery store there and they could get this, like this extra shrimp, you know, fish bits for almost nothing because the stores there were like, we don't have a market for this. So these, these folks were really excited because they could get like what for them was a very nice, um, you know, bit of animals or, you know, fish or whatever to cook for a really cheap price. Um, so yeah, so different ways to, you know, the fish that you incorporate is, doesn't necessarily look like a fish fillet. I think that's so important. Yeah, every part of the fish is nutritious and we should utilize it all. Um, I was really excited. I, I studied in Iceland and there was a place there, you know, it's a very um, seafood centric uh, economy. And one of the places there was making medical products from fish skin and they have clothing and things like that that they make, which is just so cool to me because fish aren't just edible. They can also have um, more application with, with yeah, every, every part of their being. Um, let's see here. Um, Chantel, may I ask you a question? We have one here that says, how can younger folks begin to influence those in their households who are responsible for buying groceries? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think if you can, you know, if you've got a good reason as to why, I think that's sometimes helpful rather than just saying, oh, this is great, you know, let's get some of this. It's like, what are the reasons why? And I guess sometimes it would probably be saying, why should we get that over that? Um, and, you know, understanding what implications it has in terms of cost is also important as well. But, you know, I think if it's something that potentially is more expensive, maybe it's something you have less of. So, you know, talking about kind of, I guess, animal products in, in, in many ways is, you know, and, and your fish being one that can be probably a bit more cost prohibitive in some ways, it's saying, well, actually, if you get something really nice and a small amount of it, then actually you can try it and, and go from there. And perhaps you substitute that with something that's, you know, a bit more cost effective. You know, in the UK, grains and pulses are incredibly, you know, um, cost effective. So if you can kind of substitute that for something else that could, that could help. Um, I think just, yeah, you know, maybe if it's something if you offer to cook, Saying, well, look, I really want to cook this dish. Could I have these? You know, could we perhaps look at buying these ingredients? Um, you know, I don't know many people that don't like to be cooked for, so that's probably a good kind of sweetener um, in there as well. Um, and yeah, I think just kind of educating yourself first to then be able to talk about the reasons why um, should be hopefully a helpful, helpful tool. I think that's an excellent suggestion and one that I might implement in my house. Um, dare I say, perhaps a challenge, um, maybe one new sustainable seafood dish a week in your house using ingredients um, that good food uh, that has come from somewhere uh, that is good for our planet, but also good for us. And uh, yeah, trying something new. I love that. I think that's a great idea. And I, I would like to challenge everybody here today to, to do that. So thank you for that question. Um, let's see here, we're doing pretty good for time. I'll ask a few more questions and then we'll wrap it up around 8.15. Um, Sharon, can I go back to you? Um, the majority of students eat food that's provided by the school system, depending on what country you're from. Um, what, what can public schools do um, if, if they're not serving fish that's coming from a sustainable source, how, how can we improve the sustainability and also food waste in school? Now, that is a, a great question. And, and again, getting at scales um, of how do you approach a situation? I don't know that that's, as, an, as unfortunately, as an individual, I don't know that you can go in and, 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 and force a sudden change, but I think that individuals can go in and be asking about what's going on. Um, I, my sister-in-law has actually worked in my niece's uh, school cafeteria and she was telling me, she's like, there's all these restrictions about, you know, kids, we're not allowed to give kids the leftover food. 
Like we have to make however much and then we're, we're legally prohibited from like giving kids. There's all these weird policies. And I think that trying to understand, you know, go ask questions. That's the thing I think as an individual you can really do. And it's not about necessarily, you know, you don't have to come into it with a bunch of expertise, but just ask questions. Like what happens to the leftover food? Like, where does this food come from? Like, who decides the diet? And kind of follow some of that through. Like, it can be a little bit intimidating at first, but you're not going into it trying to have, you're not starting with the answers. No one expects you to. You're trying to understand why this is the way it is. And, uh, and if you go in with, you know, willing to talk with people and listen to them, um, I think you can find out quite a bit. And then that, that opens up, hopefully, spaces or opportunities where you can say, well, what if we did it this way? What if we change that? What if instead of having, you know, hamburgers four days a week or three days a week, what if we switch that up and had some other options, you know? That's where you, you have to understand some of these systems before you can suddenly go in and suggest changes. I think that's the, that's the thing. So ask questions that uh, I have a, a concise answer for, ask lots of questions. That, that's a great answer and I think a very appropriate time to be concise. Uh, yeah, I agree. Be curious and and being curious about where your food's coming from and the impacts of it, that speaks to sustainability as well. You know, we, we can we can paint our food systems with one brush or we can be curious about how individual fish is harvested and, and things like that and and not just um, listening to to one perspective, but investigating and being curious about all perspectives and all stories around our world. So thank you so much for that. Um, I've got time, I think, for one more question and I'm really excited about this one. I'd like to go to you, Chef Mega. Um, what advice would you give to young people who want to get into the sustainable food world, particularly as a profession? Uh, I think, uh, so into the sustainable food world as a chef is what I can uh, give proper advice for. Uh, so I think that, um, Educate yourself. The learning kind of never stops in uh, in in this in this uh, sector. And um, the most important thing that I learned as a chef when I became invested in sustainability is that uh, most chefs plan their uh, plan their dish like they decide what they want to put on their menu and then they go and buy the ingredients. Uh, my biggest advice would be look at the ingredients that are available and then plan your dish and then plan your menu accordingly. Uh, speak to farmers, have um, allies in the industry, uh, form, form, uh, form good relations with fellow chefs, with uh, your farmers, with your suppliers, have conversations. I think uh, conversation is, is something that, um, that can really, really um, start a fire and like, you know, start the, the beginning or, 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 you know, just, just spread um, more awareness and share information. Don't hold back, uh, share what you know about uh, sustainability, what you're learning. Don't be scared to ask questions. And I think the world has become more of a global village now. So, uh, you know, you can talk to, chefs that you look up to you can talk to people that you look up to by just dming them on their instagram and um and yeah i think i think that's the best advice that uh, i can give and keep experimenting keep don't be scared of any ingredient or uh, keep experimenting with uh, with different ingredients and join the chef's manifesto <laughs> so yeah that's a great great answer i think your your words um, about sharing and connecting are so important and I will be private messaging you on Instagram asking you for some tips and tricks at home um, because I, I think exactly what you said connectivity is resiliency and and yeah it, it makes our our food systems a better place and and perhaps even um, our 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 um, our recipes better recipes as well just connecting with with local harvesters and things like that so we've got only a few minutes left and I just wanted to take the time to really thank our honored and inspiring panelists. Thank you all for being here today. I, I've got to say it is so cool to see some, some other females in this industry and it was just so wonderful to have the chat with you. So thank you all so much for being here today. Um, so signing off, um, 
uh, a reminder to our audience to get out there on your socials um, when you cook a sustainable meal on a Sunday, um, perhaps with the challenge that Chef Chantal um, brought up, try a new seafood dish, or maybe it's my challenge. I, I don't want to, I don't want to put you in a, a position, Chantal. Um, so, and upload your, your pictures of these dishes to Instagram and use the hashtag um, sustainable Sundays or hashtag good food for all. And that's a, a four um, as the number. Um, and then also while you're at it, follow Chef's Manifesto on Instagram. They've got some really cool stuff up there. I use it for inspiration when I'm cooking in the kitchen. Um, and visit the, um, uh, the sweet, I've got, I've got the wrong here. Yeah, Swat Pete for good. I'm pronouncing that wrong. <laughs> Kelsey? That's okay. <laughs> um, uh, TRs, thank you so much for sharing. There's a lot of resources in here and actually all those links you shared, uh, both Sharon and Chantal, any links that were provided in the chat, we will actually send these out to all of our student delegates. Um, Tiari, if I could actually quick ask you one question. I know you've been moderating this whole time and we're just wrapping up, but one of our students actually had a question that I thought was very pointed towards your experience. And I don't want to leave the session without asking about your experience as a fish harvester. So we've been talking about the importance of fish in our diets for, for health and also sustainability of the planet. But one of our students asked, if we're asking people to switch to eating more fish as a main source of protein, will it further worsen the overfishing problems? And I know you are a big advocate for reducing overfishing. So would you mind answering that in the one minute we have left? Um, I just didn't want to leave without getting some takes from you because you are an experienced uh, panelist here as well. Thank you so much, Kelsey. And thank you for that question. That is such an important question. And overfishing is, it's a huge problem, but it's not the only story that we have on our oceans. I think as Sharon was saying before, and as all the panelists have talked about, diversity is key. And it's, it's impossible, I think, to, to simplify seafood. Um, you're absolutely right to be concerned about overfishing. And this is something that I fight against every single day. Um, and, and, but I think it's also important to, to know that there are many fisheries around the world. It can be very confusing. Um, I, I understand that different species are harvested in different ways, but there are some really, really cool initiatives out there. In our fishery, we have 100% at sea monitoring, we have 100% dockside monitoring, so that every single fish that we encounter is counted, and that each individual fish harvester is held accountable for their actions at sea. And that's one way in our fishery that, that we're working towards sustainability and making sure that the fish is not only good for us nutritionally, but it's also coming from a place that is good for our ocean. Um, and I think and it, the most important part about sustainable fisheries is having peer-reviewed, well-funded science to make sure that our stocks are staying healthy and that we're understanding the dynamics that are going on in our oceans. Um, so this is my call for, for better funding of science and, and for, for anybody who might be looking at a job in fishery science, it is really cool. There's so much opportunity there and we need more um, scientists looking at our ocean, um, not only looking at, at how fisheries can, can be biologically sustainable and, and economically efficient, but also ensuring that our policies are looking at food security and ensuring optimal nutrition. So thank you so much for that question. And if you'd like to ask me anything more about fishing, um, you can reach out to me on my Instagram or other ways as well. Thank you. Fantastic. I think that's the perfect way to end this session. And we'll make sure that if uh, you want to connect with these students on Instagram, we'll share those links. Um, but yay, science. I love Sharon's cheering. I was trying to find an emoji, but I was raising my hand instead. Um, but thank you so much to our guest speakers. We so enjoyed this time with you. Uh, we will be heading to our break. So for those delegates uh, who are here now, please join back at 1030 a.m. Central Time. So in about 10, 15 minutes for our fireside chat with Gabe Laser. So thank you guests and we'll see you in a few minutes.
everyone and welcome back to the last half of our uh, workshops and sessions. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for that first opening session. I learned a lot. We're going to be posting a lot of helpful links for you in Whova. I know that some people were experiencing some glitches in Whova, so it's okay to pop out the Zoom link, but still use the Whova chat if you have any questions. And I know you'll have some questions for our next next guest speaker. Uh, we'll just be doing a little fireside chat. We wanted to create a conversation about what are those career pathways for students? We've been talking a lot about big ideas and big topics, but what does it actually mean when we uh, put it into action in our daily lives and also in our future careers as hunger fighters? And when I was thinking up uh, questions for this session, I thought of our friend Gabe, who is at the International Fund for Agricultural Development, also known as IFAD, uh, for this fireside chat. We've worked on a number of different projects together to talk about how we can connect students into food systems, into networks where these solutions are taking place and what is their own unique role. So I'm gonna share a little bit about Gabe for just a second before we get into our chat, but please share any questions you might have for Gabe in the Whova chat stream. Um, Gabe uh, is currently the Congressional and Civil Society Outreach Partnership Officer at the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Uh, which is a United Nations agency based in Rome, working near the UN's food and agricultural hub. IFAD works where poverty and hunger are deepest, in the most remote regions of developing countries and fragile situations where few development agencies venture. Prior to joining IFAD, uh, Gabe actually worked for the Food and Agricultural Organization, or FAO, as we learned in our opening session last week, uh, where he was responsible for developing strategic alliances and outreach efforts to deepen, expand, and improve partnerships and the impact uh, among FAO partners in North America. Gabe is also a native of Tanzania, and he has a master's degree in international development from the American University in Washington, D.C., and a bachelor's degree in political science from California Lutheran University. And I wanted to make sure I got your degrees in there, Gabe, because so many of our students want to get involved, but they might not know what those degrees are or what's the pathway. So if I could kick it off to you um, and have you share more of your role at IFAD and what drew you to this work? Like, how did you end up in international development? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, thank you so much for this invitation. It's really great to be with you all. Uh, I would have loved to be in Iowa in person. I've been there for almost 10 years in a row. So really sad we're not able to be there at this time to, to, to spend time together. But uh, I appreciate for, for you sharing my bio and, and for this session in particular. Um, I, as you mentioned, I'm from Tanzania and uh, uh, I grew up in uh, not, not much of a small village, but in the US sense is it a, it's a village. And I, I come from a family that's a bit blessed. You know, my parents work good, their decent jobs. They were able to for, provide for us. Uh, we, we never really we went to bed hungry. I, I would never remember a single day that that happened to us, but I was surrounded by extreme poverty, extreme hunger, extreme suffering. You know, friends, neighbors, everybody, I see their struggle. And even from when I was young, I was always wondering why. Why is that the case? Why is it that they don't have this? Why is it that they don't have that? Why is it that we don't have you know, good roads? Why is it that we don't have electricity? We, we got electricity way later in my life. Uh, we got running water phones up in my house when I was probably almost six or seven. So I remember those, but other families still today do not have that. So I started questioning the system in a sense, not knowing exactly how to describe it, but I started questioning that there are some reasons why this is not happening. You know, we come from a very wealthy country. We have amazing natural resources, rivers, lakes, massive farms, decent weather, a huge population so we can have farmers, but still we're struggling. And so I started questioning that. Uh, the other thing is I see, I saw UN cars, you know, those cool UN flags. And I was just really curious, why is it that they're doing? And I wanna be a part of that. So I've always liked to do international 
development work, even if I did not know exactly how to go about it. So when I was going to school, I just grew up thinking I want to be in the UN or I want to be a diplomat. I want to do the big government jobs and change people's lives. And so that kind of inspired me. So how I ended up choosing the degrees that, uh, that uh, Kelsey mentioned was talking to people and asking them, you know, how is it that you ended up there? What did you study? And almost everybody say, you know, you have to know politics. You know, it's not really true. You can know more other things that, like, that are beneficial. But for me, it was, you know, understand politics, understand the nature of government, and then develop from there. So the master's degree in international development that I got in, in, in American University, that really was when I decided this is the exact focus that I want to do. And that's, that's the path that ended up me, bringing me here. I'm not curious. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. And I think uh, you bring up a common theme we're seeing throughout this conference is that many of the guest speakers we've hosted, it starts with um, many of you asking why, why does it work that way? And many of our delegates all wrote papers on a topic affecting our food system. And the basis of that paper is why is this challenge occurring? So we have some very curious delegates um, Gabe, I don't know if I had shared with you, but there are over 250 student delegates from 11 different countries. And so they all have um, unique interests, unique ideas, unique passions, and uh, they all start with that why. And I think to pinpoint a little bit of what your curiosity at a young age when you were seeing uh, some of these issues taking place in your home country, um, I think it takes that curiosity and maybe, um, I'm gonna say agitator a little bit because sometimes we're afraid to ask why. Um, and I know agitator might sound like a negative word here, but many of our delegates um, are not afraid to ask the why. Um, um, but I also wanna make sure we highlight when we're asking why does it work this way or how did this come to be? Um, the other reason I wanted to bring you in as an IFAD representative is because I appreciate that IFAD has uh, solutions or developed solutions that are people-centered and partnership-oriented. So when you're asking those why questions, you're asking those why questions to the local community um, and asking them what they see. Um, oftentimes, because we're all human, we might want to be the one to solve hunger or the one to fix climate change. Um, but your mission at IFAD reminds us that it's impossible to be successful all on our own. And because we want this session to be about tangible tips for students, could you share more about IFAD's people-centered approach as well as any lessons you've learned, not just at IFAD, because I know you've only been there a short time, but that partnership building approach that you uh, have experienced those skills what are some ways that students can help build partnerships while being inclusive of the communities that they're working in? Wonderful. No, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for that, the, the broader summary of, you know, what we need to do and, and what comfort me. And I wanted to just make sure this very, very clear because we're talking to students is I feel like that the, we're hearing bad news a lot. The number of hungry people you know, what COVID has done to populations around the world, what climate change has done to, to, to so many people, in particular, smallholder farmers, the, the actual people who feed the world, uh, what conflict is doing, uh, what economic downturn is doing to people. So things seem horrendous. And in some places, they are. But what comfort me is the 200 and some students who are sitting there right now in different parts of the world listening to this program, asking why and asking what can I do and also willing to push the boundary. And so agitator is absolutely the right word. And we need that those people because then they are the people who think outside the box. They're the one who break the mold and say, you know, actually you've always done things this way. There might be another way of doing things. So absolutely love that, that, that the, ter the terms ter uh, agitator that you use is perfect. Now, in my particular role, uh, both here at IFAD, you know, my, the, the 10 some years I spent at FAO, and also about six, seven years I spent at Bread for the World at Alliance, 
the question and what has been driving me and what I think sometimes is, is the solution or one of the solution is that no one entity has all the answers. And so you need to be able to bring diverse groups, uh, individual uh, institutions to ask the why question and everybody should put their solutions on the table. And then let's as a group come up with what we think works well in Kenya, for example, or in Tanzania or in Indonesia. If IFAD has its role, we focus on the rural poor. I mean, these are the poorest of the poor, the ones that nobody can reach anymore. We focus on those people. You know, guess what? 800 million of them are the ones who are producing a lot of the food that we're consuming. So we want to invest in them. And we, 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 we you use the right terminology, the centered approach. We want to invest equally to the men and equally to the women. Because in other situation, you find that men can walk into a bank and get a loan, but a woman cannot because they don't have ownership of the land or they don't have access to some collateral to be able to buy seeds. So if I'd say that's not going to happen, and we also know the, 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 the uh, benefit for when you invest with women versus men. Research has been done and we can showcase that. The return on investing to women for, uh, on women is 20, 30% more than, than men. Um, you know, taking care of kids at home as well and, and keeping the kids healthy uh, and all of that. So the returns are better. So we want that to be at the core of what we're doing, that we are gender balanced, we are inclusive, you know, everybody is a part of the table. You know, we are helping with the productive resources for this community. Uh, we want to make sure that the agriculture system, again, rural people, agriculture is the core uh, uh, work that they do, that they employ, that they are productive, uh, is solid, and we want it to also be sustainable. We're looking for the long-term uh, outcome. Again, uh, uh, the, the result of all this work that we're trying to do is we want to make sure that, that their food is secure, that they have an increased income, and also the, the nutrition benefit that's left to the family is there as well. So those are the kind of core of what drives us. Um, back to you, Kelsey. Thank you so much, Gabe. Um, that gender balance is so key. I think we take it for granted in some countries um, because maybe in, in some countries, women have more influence than in others, but it's still not something we've achieved globally still. And I know many of our students wrote about that. Um, another key piece of that inclusivity that I know is important to IFAD and also important to the World Food Prize is including youth, um, especially since uh, the agricultural field is one of the largest employers of youth and the potential returns of investing in young people are truly boundless in terms of achieving food security, poverty reduction, generating employment, as well as you know, peace and local stability. It all lies in listening to the youth. And we saw that with the United Nations Food System Summit and that there were young people serving as youth vice chairs to uh, share their demands, their, uh, their hopes, their dreams. And um, we know that young people are better at taking risks and uh, being innovative and adapting to new technology because they think about things in much different ways than us adults do. And these skills that young people have are gonna be critical to reforming our food system. We learned in the last year and a half through the COVID-19 pandemic that there were a lot of issues that existed, but COVID-19 really exposed them. And that the world really truly saw that the food system is not working. Um, and so I think youth are being heard more, but we still have a lot of room to grow. Could you talk more about how uh, I thought it is engaging young people at the local level when you're doing this partnership building on your projects? Yeah, no, absolutely. That, that's really great, some, great summary. Yes, uh, it, it is a big priority. So besides the, the gender component, I think youth is up on top as well, and indeed indigenous uh, people as well. Uh, is there. So, but in this particular uh, with youth, you know, the, and you mentioned this, that one of the most important thing is we know that agriculture provides the largest employment for young people. And so 
the goal for us is to start introducing, you know, agriculture from when people are young. So we're developing a variety of, variety of curriculum to share with schools, you know, teaching kids about where does the food come from um, and who grows their food. I mean, one of the biggest challenges we're facing is the largest number of farmers who are going to be retiring in the next five, 10 years. And agriculture, you know, is hard work. And we know that a lot of young people don't want to go to agriculture in the same way that their father, grandfather, great grandfather used to do. So we are promoting new technologies. We're promoting, you know, the value chain, the market. So you might you, you might not be actually farming, but you operate a store that buys product from a farmer. You create, you know, instead of just buying oranges, make orange juice and sells and creating this value to the chain that connect from farming all the way to somebody's table. You know, those are things that people, young people like. They are quick, you know, mobile technologies. It's, it's, it's incredible access to that and what you can do with it. It, it is really, really valuable and useful. So we are trying to provide these opportunities for young people to, to figure and come up with a solution that we're not thinking about that some people are questioning the utility for them. We think young people are likely to adopt those faster than, than, than you know, maybe the previous generation. So, but, but the biggest thing is, is you get too many young people moving into cities, there are no jobs, you then have the other consequences of, you know, you know, crime, uh, diseases, and everything else. But if you are able to maintain and keep those people in, in the farm area, that's great. But the other side of that equation as well, you have to make sure that, you know, you build roads for, for, for these people to stay there. You provide the services that are valuable, uh, that, that are needed to maintain a business. And you create an environment that somebody can get a license to operate a business you know, in a week than waiting for three or four months to do that. So, you know, avoiding the corruption that entails in that. So government have to create those conditions in place that will keep young people there, but then institutions such as FAO and, and other research organization need to provide the space for young people to learn, uh, you know, receive the knowledge and the and expertise to participate in these things. And we can talk about, you know, in terms of what is needed for these younger people who are thinking about going into, into, into this field. You know, what kind of classes do you need to prepare to take? And a lot of that starts now. I mean, you already, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you already in that path, you already kind of figured what you want to study. Yeah, I, you know, we need agronomists, we need economists, we need, you know, uh, people who can deal with animal health issues. Um, so there are a lot of the fields that are there that are struggling to replace their, their generation that's retiring with young, new energy, new blood to be in place. Um, and so we are looking to you guys to, to kind of take, take on the mantle uh, of the challenges that are, that are facing us now and coming in, in your generation. Um, mm -hmm. I'll start, stop there and by Kelsey, you have to. I feel like we could go on and on. There's, you are a wealth of knowledge, but um, I think you make a great point about young people might not want to go into farming, but farming is not just the field. Farming is science, farming is policy, farming is health. And um, you reminded me of a quote by our 2017 World Food Prize laureate, Dr. Akin Adeshina. And when he won the prize, he had said, you know, we praise doctors and lawyers, which we definitely need in this world, but you only need, you need a farmer every day. You don't need a doctor every day. You need a farmer every day. Uh, because we all eat to sustain our livelihood, which in turn keeps us healthy and keeps us safe. Um, and so I love that quote from him because we need to be thinking differently about uh, the agricultural field and how needed young people both are, but also having adults recognize how important youth are in, in decision making uh, today and every day. Um, and actually, uh, I, I have a couple more questions for you myself, but we are actually getting quite a few from the students. So this uh, transitions into one of the great questions we've already got posted. So how does a young person balance maybe their lack of experience because they're so young with their passion? And so um, where do you suggest they get connected? Um, I know IFAD works in a lot of like remote areas, but are 
are there youth advisory councils or ways that they can tap into networks where where those big decisions are being made? Yeah, no, absolutely. So the, first of all, you are already doing the right thing, the fact that you are in this session. So you already know a really great network uh, and a good start. So, so that's a great place. Um, so there are a variety of international forums that takes place every year. So uh, for example, the World Food Day, which just happened on October 16, this is a, a global initiative where issues of hunger, food, sec food insecurity are being discussed, policymakers are offering solutions. So Sign, sign up for those things. The UN Food System Summit just ended. Lots happen around that. Uh, we are just getting ready to go to uh, COP26, uh, the climate conference in Glasgow. There is the website. Sign up, get their emails, get the information, educate yourself. But beside that, you know, finding out what, what is that passion? What is it that you feel at this moment you want to study or to, to become later on? So if uh, IFAD uh, has offices around the world, and so you can either tap into those offices or within uh, IFAD headquarters itself, they are experts in the field. So in some of them, you can actually go to IFAD website, you can look for expert right now on livestock. And if you write to them and say, hey, I'm a student, I'm really interested in this issue, could you share some information? They will connect to you and trust me, there's nothing that experts like to do than to talk to young people. Uh, it, takes them, it takes them away from the politics and the bureaucracy, but to deliver and to create this pipeline for future generations. So, so you can do that. Uh, that's one alternative. Um, I know, you know, LinkedIn, uh, I don't know if most of you are there yet, it's a great source and you can find communities that work on specific issues. Um, so in, in agriculture and in health and, you know, that's what you're looking for. So that, that's another resource. Um, you know, the other one is USCID it has a variety of internships that I know uh, uh, the World Food Prize is a part of. So depending on your age group and whatnot, you know, some of those are available to you. But do know that as well, you know, IFAD and other UN agencies, we have a variety of short-term internships. We have, uh, you know, consultancies. We have, you know, uh, they're called like junior professional officers or associate professional officers. So these are, you know, later maybe when somebody has a master's degree, uh, you know, a few years of experience. So all of those are available for you, but you need to start thinking about them now. So for example, language requirement, in the, if, if you're thinking of the UN system, it's critical. So there are five UN languages and try to pick one, start learning something, you know, Spanish, uh, you know, Chinese, if that's the right you want to go, French, Russian, I mean, start something because it just gives you even much more leverage when you show up to some of these interviews, and, you know, against other, you know, you come up with a European and they speak five languages, but they might not have the experience that you've heard and the research you've done. So language requirements are, are really important for you to consider. But just don't lose your passion if you hit a wall. I think that's that's what happens sometimes where maybe I'm not sure who to speak to, I'm not sure who to contact. I think just try every other channels, but for sure you can email me. That that's a guarantee I will respond to you and we can talk one on one specifically what you are interested in for that uh, to, to discuss. Kelsey, that's one. Great. A lot of wonderful information in there. And actually, we're going to make sure that any links you reference, like the internships with USAID or with the United Nations, we'll make sure to get those out to our students. And um, if you're willing and interested to talk to any of our students, a common theme that we've seen uh, throughout uh, this week is that you don't have to wait for an invitation. You just have to start. And uh, just being curious, um, nobody's going to, uh, you know, maybe they will, but sometimes they, they just won't reach out their hand. And I think young people have been energized by what we've seen around the world over the last year and a half around climate change and that nobody's fixing this for us. So we're going to fix it and we're going to demand action. Okay. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing your email in there. You might get a flood of emails from students, but they might be working for you one day. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. I think in that, that you just said, you just hit, you know, the nail on is like, 
just think about the things that we're saying, what's gonna happen in 2030 if we don't change our path? What's gonna happen in 2050 when we don't, if we don't change the way we're doing things? You will be a young adult in the middle of that. So accept no for an answer because you are the one who's gonna be paying for it. So I am firing you up to go and make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. This is, is their future, uh, for sure. Um, could you, you touch on it earlier, and I know we've talked about this before in previous projects, but a student asked, why isn't farming seen as a more prestigious occupation in many countries? What's, what's the holdback? What are the stereotypes? Um, I think all of our delegates here today understand that agriculture is important, but this is larger than just this group that we have to ignite the whole world in seeing agriculture as uh, the premier career field that it is. And so what are those misperceptions about agriculture and why, why is it not seen more in a prestigious light? Yeah, yeah no, I, I think if I speak from my, my background and my friends who are there, you know, if you see an Africa farmer today, they are still using the back hole. It's sitting like, you know, in a farm, you know, trying to create a little irrigation system, you know, by waiting for rain, for example, using seeds that maybe their grandparents and parents passed them down to, to, to them, uh, literally just growing enough food to barely feed them and nothing to even sell food that whatever they are growing you know when the pest come through it's gone and that's literally their investment so it's very risky it's very hard working uh it's, it's a little to no real return who wants that when you are friend left the village went to the city and they show up in a month or two with a new bicycle or a new motorcycle or a new, you know, whatever. So people are saying, no, I'm not gonna sit through this. This is horrible. Now, think about that to a farmer in Iowa, a farmer in Indiana with a 250,000 machine that is driven by GPS that has precise amount of seeds dropped in exact location. I mean, the technology that does everything, you hardly ever struggle. You have, you know, irrigation systems that work throughout the year. You have amazing seeds that fight drought and diseases and all of that. And yes, you struggle with, you know, if, 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 the, if, if the bank doesn't give you a big loan or, or if the market goes down, then, you know, but then you have subsidies from the government to help you because, because something bad happened. It's tough. This is serious business. So why would somebody go there if you don't have the safety net mechanism to help you? If you don't have the right seeds, the right output? So that's what we are promoting. That's why we are pushing these governments to provide. So somebody know there is safety in staying in agriculture. If their income and the money that they earn is what's needed to send their kids to school, they want it to have a guarantee that that money will be there. But if they do agriculture and they have a fail season, their kids are not going to school and they're not eating. It's too risky. So we want to de-risk is what we call. We want to provide insurance mechanisms. So just in case that happened, you have a plan B um, and, and you know, right. seeds up and everything else. So it, it, it is that. And just think about if you are sitting in that situation, would you stay? But what if you have all these other, you know, you have health insurance for a reason. What if you had any health insurance in a sense that protects you for if something goes bad? What if you had those roads? What if you have the market? What if you have the technology? You are more likely to stay as well in agriculture. So we wanna provide those what ifs uh, in place. And also just you know, encouraging particular women to stay in agriculture because that's the other thing. It's just mostly you're getting boys. And then you know, the other question, and I, I will stop shortly, it is you know, this issue about collateral, ownership of land, land tenure. Men and women should have equal land tenure rights. So when a woman walk to a bank and they can say, I own this piece of land, here's the piece of paper, I want money for a project, they get the same thing that, uh, that men also get. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can get passionate about this. So. <laughs> no, it's fine. I, I'm just, my wheels are spinning too. There's just, yeah, why would you want to go into that field if you don't have the resources, the technology, it's seen as a low class job that, that doesn't sound appealing. And, um, 
we there's definitely a lot of cracks in that system and that's what i appreciate about ifat that you work in the most uh, remote areas where access to equipment and technology and resources is not necessarily available, but that's the hard work. We can have this fancy new drone that monitors our fields, or we can have, um, you know, these tractors that, like you said, like monitor exactly how much you're putting in, but that technology does no good if it's not getting to the farmers who need it. And I think uh, that's a beautiful way to round out this conversation because our founder, Norman Borlaug, the founder of the World Food Price Foundation, always said, take it to the farmer. And a lot of our delegates, I am talking to, to you delegates right now, there's a lot of fun, fancy ideas out, out there, but the hard work is when you need to navigate those, those tough uh, relationships, uh, those areas where they don't receive resources, where they're not being heard. And so making sure that you're combining all this technology with the need to advocate and to uh, engage with these rural communities. Um, I know we're um, just up on time here, but one last question for you, Gabe. Um, any thoughts for our students? Um, I had had a question that asked, I want to do it all. I want to focus on climate change. I want to focus on nutrition. And many of our students might be in this space where um, intersectionality is really important in our food system. So if you want to work in nutrition, you have to talk about the food that's grown. And if it's um, safe for the environment, is it sustaining the environment um, or reducing harm. Um, there's so many different career paths available. I know you talked about the internships at various UN agencies, also USAID. Um, where, where do they start? Is there like a one-stop shop for, I want to go into international development or is it just a big Google? What do you, <laughs> it, what do you suggest on how they get their stuff? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a big Google. It's a big Google. I started as an intern at Bread for the World. And I literally was like, I studied the organization. I know they're working on food insecurity and nutrition work. And I said, this is what I really want to learn. And particularly, I wanted to understand about U.S. domestic hunger issues. My question was, how is it the wealthiest country still has that many young people who are hungry? 14 million, 40 million or so. And so I wanted to figure that out. So that's how I got into this. And then it literally started opening that door. So start with the organization that you really like, that you're passionate about. Study the organization, really study them. And then find people within the organization that you can connect with. Ask for an informational interview. This is a simple conversation. I just want, I mean, I mean very curious about IFPRI. I'm curious about the World Bank. Can I talk about, and then from there, you just kind of build it. And that's when you can find out, you know, maybe I would like to do an internship there. It's that path you have to, because you know you, you show up for a job interview. Somebody sometimes sometimes they tell you you don't have experience. You have to build it from somewhere. So don't want to be the president, the CEO of company before you start being an intern. So do your work, earn your right. Because in, even when you're doing this, halfway through you might say, you know, maybe nutrition field is not mine. Maybe I wanted to do a grow economics economy. Maybe I want to do. This. So you have to start somewhere. But you need to to say first of all, this is what I, this these are my values. This is what I want to do. This organization fulfill those values. You don't you don't have to be hundred percent and talk to somebody there, and that is the path. But if you are you know for me, I wanted to work for the UN. I knew it, so I was gonna make this happen, and somehow eventually happened. But if you, you don't, I mean, they are private company, they are research institution, they are advocacy organization, outreach organization. And then they are, you know, the big science, if that's the focus, but you need to first of all say, these are my values. This is what I want, I hope to accomplish. I feel like this organization helped me then connect to the organization. And it's as simple as literally go to the organization and they, they always have about the organization, there is a name somewhere there or go to LinkedIn, Google the organization, you will find a bunch of people who work there. And I know you guys are very savvy with technology, so I don't need to, you know, go to Twitter, you'll find everything about the organization. <laughs> so back to you, Kelsey. And if you can't find it, just email Gabe. That's so. exactly. Yeah, if, all, if all fail, I've given you my email and my LinkedIn page. <laughs> uh, that's so, thank you so much, Gabe. That was so helpful. And I think you really got it. 
the how, like our students are so passionate, but how do they get into these networks and these careers? So I know we're a bit over time. So thank you for sharing um, in this uh, knowledge sharing with us. Um, just a few reminders for our student delegates. There is an optional daily debrief where you can uh, spend time live with your small groups. Um, that's at three o'clock central time. And then we will also share out all the resources Gabe was just talking about in an email. So be on that lookout for that later today. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks so much, Gabe. Thank you guys. My pleasure. Have a good day.